fascinated by a lot of different types of pollination ecology and biology. So one area of work that I've done that I didn't mention previously are the vulture bees. So that's something that I think people get really excited about. So we can think of bees as vegetarian wasps in the evolutionary tree. And then a specialized group of bees has actually reverted and actually is carnivorous. And some of them will eat meat, like, and this is vertebrate, decomposing vertebrate meat. But I think it's also necessary for us to think about collective systemic change. So mm -hmm. I think at the individual level, planting pollinator habitat in your, gar in your garden, planting pollinator friendly plant species that are native and perennial and will bloom throughout the season is really good. Hi everyone, welcome to today's episode of Let's Talk. I am excited to host our guest for this episode, Dr. Lola Figueroa. In our previous video, she shared with us her experience in overcoming rejection in academia. You should definitely check out that video. I know you are going to learn a lot from it and it's going to inspire you to keep on going in your journey as well. You will see the link to that video in the bio. On this note, welcome again, Lala. Hi, Amelia. So happy to be here. Great. I would like to ask, what inspired you to pursue a career in ecology? I think there are a lot of things that I find really fascinating about ecology. I love how systems are connected and the functioning of webs. And so I think from a side, it's just fascinating, but I also think it's fundamental for thinking about sustainability and what we can do to maintain the biodiversity we have and value around the world. So I think both of those things together, like an appreci a deep appreciation and fascination, help me try to work the best that I can to be in this field. I know how passionate you are about bees, flowers, and parasites. Um, so could you start by telling us your research. Absolutely. So I would describe myself as a conservation community ecologist. I really am fascinated by how different parts of the system are linked together and also how does that affect the functioning of the ecosystem. And so I work primarily with bees and pollinators because pollinators contribute to the maintaining of the biodiversity of flowers, which really underlie the functioning of all ecosystems on the planet. And so pollinators are not only fascinating from a functional perspective of how they contribute to pollination and fruit set and diversity of plants, but also in terms of conservation and the maintaining of this. So there's the food component, there's the plant diversity component, and also they're incredibly beautiful. Bees are, so, I, I just find them absolutely fascinating and beautiful to look at. And so for my research, for my dissertation work at Cornell University in the entomology department, I focus on the understanding of how pathogens of bees are transmitted between, flower, between bees through shared use of flowers. So with a lot of COVID, we've been thinking about how contact surfaces could affect transmission. And so that's the example of flowers. A bee comes in, she's infected, she comes in looking for pollen and nectar, deposits pathogens because she's sick. Then the next one, she's looking for pollen and nectar, she's susceptible, she can pick it up, get sick and move it on to the next flower. So there's, there are these networks of transmission. And I'm really fascinated about understanding how does that happen? Are there flowers that are more or less likely to transmit the pathogens to the bees? And what can we do about it? What are the next, the next steps? And so that was a lot of the work that I've done that I did for my dissertation work. Wow, awesome. So you talked about pathogens. I am curious to know how pathogens affect bees. What are the impacts that they have on bee health? A great question, Amelia. So historically, we've only thought of pathogens in honeybees and bumblebees because they're the most commercially important. And so there's been a lot of work in looking at like, what are the pathogens that influence these bees? And what's the diversity of pathogens and what do they do? And so we have a greater understanding and there's so many different types of pathogens. There's trypanosomatic gut pathogens. So many types of protozoans, 
there are bacteria, there are viruses, there are nematodes, there are all sorts of different pathogens. And some of them will increase mortality of severely. Some of them will be detrimental when combined with other stressors. So possibly when you're nutritionally stressed and you have the pathogen, your mortality increases. Some of them for the bees will reduce overwintering survival. Some of them will affect them cognitively. So there's some pathogens that whenever they're infected, they manipulate the flowers less effectively. They're, they're less effective foragers. And so there's many different ways in which the bees can be influenced by pathogens. But I think now some of the work that I did was screening pathogens beyond honeybees and bumblebees and including the entire community. There's 20,000 species of bees in the world, right? And when we're wow. thinking of bees or bumblebees, we're only thinking of a few. But when I screened, I found that 65% of bee species that I screened for had pathogens. We have no mm. idea for most of these what the impact is, if they're just moving the pathogen along or if they're actually getting sick. And if they're getting sick, how is that influencing their health? And so I think there's a lot to be developed in this area of the broader pollinator community of what are the impacts for these bees. Wow. Thank you for explaining all of that. And I would also like to ask, how are these pathogens transmitted among the bees? So there's many different types of ways that pathogens can be spread. Some of them can be transmitted mouth to mouth. Um, mm -hmm. Some can be transmitted sexually. And, but the mode of transmission that I'm, inter I'm in most interested in is fecal oral transmission. For social bees, which are not the majority of bees, we usually think of social bees as the majority, but that's only about 20% of the bee diversity in the world. Oh, okay. Colonies. And so when there's a high density, if there's defecation that occurs, that one can easily envision how that transmission would occur. But also if there's defecation on a shared resource such, such as a flower, that can enable transmission as well. And what's interesting about that is it can allow between colonies of the same species and even between members of different species. So it really can facilitate transmission at the broader community level. Wow, awesome. Um, how does the role of flowers come in? I know that most farmers are only probably knowledgeable of bees being pollinators of their crops, but how does the flowers also would be able to, like how will the flowers be able to control for the pathogen spread among the bees? So that's a great question. We know from work, including Lynn Adler's work at the University of Massachusetts, that different plant species differ in the potential to transmit the pathogens to incoming bees. So there could be a potential of lower likelihood of transmission. But some other work that we're doing in collaboration with, uh, in Lynn's lab, in collaboration with Becky Irwin's lab at NC State, and among other colleagues, is looking at the role of different plant species on reducing existing infection. So they mm -hmm. found that sunflower pollen consistently reduces the infections in bumblebees of a type of gut pathogen. And so potentially, some plants could be used medicinally in that bees could go forage on them and reduce infections. So this is still ongoing work. We still want to evaluate because it's a very strong pattern in the lab, but we're still wanting to evaluate how consistent it is in the field, how many species of bee it applies to, and also can we actually influence at the community level. So we have a new grant that was recently funded by the National Science Foundation to evaluate just that. What is the role of, sun, of the sunflower family pollen in mediating the health and the dynamics of pathogens in bee communities, focusing primarily on the bumblebee. Awesome, great. So talking more about, um, to talk more about your research, what is the knowledge gaps that your research um, is filling? So there's a lot of different areas. I think I'm fascinated by a lot of different types of pollination ecology and biology. So one area of work that I've done that I didn't mention previously are the vulture bees. So that's something that I think people get really excited about. So we can think of bees as vegetarian wasps in the evolutionary tree. 
And then a specialized group of bees has actually reverted and actually is carnivorous. And some of them will eat meat, like, and this is vertebrate, decomposing vertebrate meat and go to flowers. And some of them said goodbye to the flowers altogether and get their protein exclusively from vertebrate carcasses. And so we have done some work looking at the microbiota of these bees. And there's so much that we don't know about the microbiology, about the ecology of these vulture bees. So that's one area that I really want to pursue because it's fascinating and going to these, I mean, hiking and doing field ecology in the tropics is just one of the most wonderful things and what a privilege. Um, in terms of bee disease transmission, looking at just as I was mentioning, can we actually apply our understanding of the role of flowers on bee disease transmission to scale up at reasonable field realistic concentrations? So can we influence the probability of transmission to the level of the community within, let's say, a three, four, five year span? And so mm -hmm. I think something that we're trying to evaluate to look at the dynamics of the host, of the pathogen, and of the flower in mediating all of those dynamics. Wow. So bees are important, and I believe we all have a role to play in their health. What would you like to tell the farmer or like even the individual listening to this video from their homes to how can they be able to contribute to bee health? I think that's a great question. And there's a lot of different scales of how we can promote pollinator health. There, there is a role for individual action, but I think it's also necessary for us to think about collective systemic change. So mm -hmm. I think at the individual level, planting pollinator habitat in your, gar in your garden, planting pollinator friendly plant species that are native and perennial and will bloom throughout the season is really good. Reducing the spray of pesticides in your garden, if it's unnecessary, that would be one way to go. But also at the collective level, can we urge our policymakers to take stances that really, for example, lawns that are being sprayed and mowed unnecessarily, can those be converted to pollinator friendly habitats that mm -hmm. really reduce the amount of inputs for the land managers, but also can provide floral resources for these really important pollinators. So thinking at both scales, I think is a really important way for us to move forward. Wow. Thank you so much for sharing that. I, the final question before we run up for this session is to ask what are some of the ongoing research that you are doing and um, what is you have the plans for the future? <laughs> so I have a few projects in the works. One is the work with the vulture bees and continuing to understand the microbes that are in these really cool and funky bees that we know very little about. This work with the sunflower pollen and sunflower family pollen and how that influences bee dynamics at the community level, and also with a special focus on the common eastern bumblebee, Bombus impatiens. But then I'm also really interested in bee bioacoustics and how we can develop strategies for monitoring bees using their signals of their wing beats. And so there's a lot of projects in the works and something that I'm really, really passionate about. Wow, great. It has been a wonderful time um, with you on both of the sessions. Make sure you check Laula's work and all the cool stuff that she does. I remain your host, Amelia. Let's enjoy science together. Thank you so much, Amelia. It's been a pleasure.